Welcome to our online service at Spearfish United Methodist Church. We're glad that you could join us. And in this service, we're going to be talking about good people and bad people and pointing fingers and trying to figure out who's blowing smoke and who's looking in the mirror. So I hope you enjoy our worship and that it builds you up and that we're able to worship Jesus together. Our first scripture is from Psalm 84, verses 1 through 7. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Let's enter into a time of prayer together. Eternal God, the Holy One, we are often presumptuous when we come before you. We are often like the Pharisee who went up to pray. We can feel his ways inside of us. We feel like the Pharisee when we feel that somehow we are of all your people most deserving. We are like the Pharisee when we feel that we are not ready like other people we are not needy like other people because we are so self-reliant. We are like the Pharisee when we feel that we are a cut above those with whom we live daily. We are like the Pharisee when we are uncomfortable with the evil within us and we do such a marvelous job of self-deception by denying it. We are like the Pharisee when we feel that it is better to project evil onto others where we are able to see it so blatantly. In all these ways, we are the one in that story that Jesus told. And in all these ways, we are overcome by a pride which is unbecoming of your people. Forgive us, Lord, and save us from this useless and destructive pattern Give us the courage to pray that you would also be merciful to us because we are sinners. Grant us to find true humility of heart and spirit and the courage to look inwardly even when we fear what we may find. Help us again to discover and to believe in your grace which awaits a humble and contrite spirit. And help us to gain a faith which includes those who struggle those who sin, those who have a ways to go. Make us into gracious people who know we live by grace and who make allowances for rather than criticize others. Give us generous hearts. Help us to own the humanity with which we share with others and to embrace all your children. And let us join together in this unison prayer. We do not lose heart. We who humbly admit their sins find favor with God. For God answers prayer and forgives transgression. Help us to believe this good news. We are forgiven and freed to newness of life. Amen. Our second scripture is from Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Four preachers met for a friendly gathering. During the conversation, one preacher said, our people come to us and pour out their hearts, confess certain sins and needs. Let's do the same with each other. Confession, after all, is good for the soul. In due time, all agreed. One confessed that he liked to go to movies and would sneak off when away from his church. The second confessed to liking to smoke cigars, and the third one confessed to liking to play cards. You can tell this is an older story. When it came to the fourth one, though, he wouldn't confess. The others pressed him, saying, Come on now, we've confessed ours. What's your secret or vice? And finally he answered, It's gossiping, and I can hardly wait to get out of here. (laughs) So our text today presents us with an open and shut case, I think. We look at the story and we ask, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? And in this story, we kind of say that the Pharisee is the bad guy. We're kind of conditioned throughout our lives to say, oh, Pharisee, that's the bad guy. That's the hypocrite. Obviously, must be the bad guy in this story too. And then we ask, well, who can we relate to? And obviously, we all relate to the sinner who gets up in the back and you know sits in the back pew because, well, the front is just too close. Well, we sit back there and we pray and we can relate to that one. Well, what we have today in our passage, I think, is a case of smoke and mirrors. Now, the Pharisee that we meet is blowing smoke. The Pharisee is hiding himself behind a facade. He's pointing at the bad guys that aren't him, thieves, evildoers, adulterers or this tax collector over here. And he looks briefly at what he gives up in order to be such a good person. He gives up a tenth of his income in the tithe. And he fasts twice a week, doesn't eat twice a week. While we find the tax collector, the tax collector is looking in the mirror His position is away from other people. His gestures, as we find them in the text, are that he's looking down, he's he's beating his breast. His words are, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Smoke and mirrors. The Pharisee blowing smoke, the tax collector looking in the mirror. And we ask again, well, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? And I think, again, we look at it and we say, well, isn't it obvious that the good guy is the tax collector? Well, the fact is Jesus has tricked us into cheering for the bad guy and we may not even be aware of it. Because the Pharisee, even though we have this picture of this mean person up here, the Pharisee is basically would be compared to a church leader, someone who's a leader in the church, concerned with the way that he lives, with good moral character, upstanding in the community, cares about others, concerned to set a good example. And so he sets a good example by fasting, by tithing. And he does this because the leader can't expect people to do what he doesn't do. So if I want others to tithe and give these commitment cards, then I better be the first one in line putting my commitment card in there. Or if I'm a leader in the church, I need to be the first to put my commitment card in there because I can't expect people to do what I don't do. And he's pleased that he's not the other guy. 
He thinks, there but for the grace of God go I. I could easily be in the tax collector's shoes, but thank God I'm not. He thinks he's been saved from all of that, that, that there's no need for him to repent anymore because he's not as bad as that guy. And he's safe because he's not like that guy. And I wonder how many of us today are thanking God that we weren't born into the family of drug dealers. I mean, we're thankful for that. I'm glad that I was not born into a family of drug dealers. Now, the tax collector, on the other hand, was seen as a traitor or an idolater, someone who agreed with the Roman occupation and actually was making a buck off of the Roman occupation. He was a thief, or overcharging the people and collecting interest on their back payments. He was an outsider. He wasn't a part of the community. He was without rights. He was unwelcome in the community. Nobody wanted to be seen with the tax collector. And what else is he going to pray? If, if this is the situation he's in, he has a sense of inadequacy, a sense of his own sin, a sense of being an outsider, an outcast, not allowed in the temple, not allowed around, <coughs> around good people. The bottom line, as one commentator writes, is that the Pharisee is a good guy and the tax collector is a crook. Good guys care for their families. They're honest in their business affairs. They contribute generously to the needy and tithe to support religious institutions. On the other hand, the crook is a crook. The tax collector is a traitor, having sold out to the enemy. He's a corrupter, maintaining a system of exploitations and turning every neighbor into a victim of organized greed. And yet, and yet, Jesus lets him off the hook at the end of the parable. And we cheer for the bad guy. Possibly, we might need to picture a drug, a drug pusher in saggy jeans and a torn Harley shirt standing on our church steps, smoking a joint and saying, I'm no good. Over against the young drug pusher, we might depict an active member, one of us, a church officer who loves their family and is the one to call whenever you want to get some sort of a charitable program going in the church. How on earth are we going to cheer for the drug pusher or say that somehow God has justified him over the church member? Why should we cheer for the tax collector? And we might say, well, well, at least he was honest about it. I did it, but, it, but at least I admitted that I did it. I'm a sinner, but, it, but at least I admit that I'm a sinner. It reminds me of the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. You remember the story? Anybody? What's the story? He said he chopped down the cherry tree. Did, well, he actually did chop down the cherry tree, and his father came to him and he said, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. At least he admitted he did it, even if this was the result. You know, um, my father also told a story about a, a, a young boy who was caught after he had pushed an outhouse down the hill. And he came to his father, and his father said, are you the one who pushed the outhouse down the hill? And uh, the boy said, well, yeah, I was. And so he told him he was going to be punished. And he said, but, but dad, George Washington, when he chopped down the cherry tree, he told his dad that he had done it and he didn't get punished. Well, that's because George Washington's dad wasn't in the cherry tree when he chopped it down. The Prussian king, Frederick the Great, was once touring a Berlin prison. And the pr prisoners fell on their knees before him, and they were all proclaiming their innocence, except for one man. And this one man remained silent, and Frederick called to him, that is mine. <laughs> Nobody calling me, but I had set a timer for six o'clock for some reason. I guess the sermon's over at that point. That's... <laughs> 
So this Prussian king is at a Berlin prison and the per- prisoners are all on their knees before him and they're proclaiming their innocence, except for one man who remained silent. And Frederick called on him. He said, why are you here? Armed robbery, your majesty, was the reply. And are you guilty? Yes, indeed, your majesty, I deserve my punishment. And so Frederick then summoned the jailer and ordered him, release this guilty wretch at once. I will not have him kept in this prison where he will corrupt all the fine, innocent people who occupy it. At least he was honest about it, right? Well, I want to give you two reasons tonight why Jesus has us cheer for the bad guy. Well, let's take a look at why he does this. And the reason is because there are two things that the good guy says. One is he says that these were people who were confident of their own righteousness. Look at me, I'm good enough. God has got to let me in. God has got to listen to me because I'm good. I tithe, I fast. I have a claim on heaven. My own righteousness, my own goodness demands that God be on my side. God owes me one, is basically what these folks are thinking. The second thing is that they look down on everyone else. This Pharisee is saying, I'm the only one living in the right way. I'm not living like that person. And what he's doing is he's basically creating a stairway out of this person where he can step up by stepping on that man's back. He puts others down in order to build himself up. And we fail to recognize our common humanity as sinners, as those who have no right to call on God. But those who are also created in the image of God, like us to point to someone else and says, not like that one, is to say, I'm not like that other person who also bears the image of God. These things, these claiming our own righteousness and looking down on others are nothing but a smoke screen. We're blowing smoke. And I wonder, does that work with God to blow a bunch of smoke around and try to pretend before God? Probably not. Perhaps what we need to do is we need to be the one looking in the mirror, seeing our own inadequacies, seeing our own sinfulness. As we see in a mirror, God sees us in truth. And God doesn't see us for our sin. God sees us as human beings created in God's image created to love God and to love one another, created to care for the world, created to have life and life abundantly, created in need of forgiveness and atonement. And so we pray, have mercy on me. This person is praying in the temple And even as the Pharisee is blowing smoke, there is smoke in the temple, sacrificial smoke, which is intended to bring forgiveness of sins. And so the tax collector sees what is happening in the temple and says, I hope that what's happening here can help me too. Think of the person who wanders into a worship service sees what's going on, sees the good people, and says, I hope what's happening here is for me too. Mercy means made righteous. And I wonder today, if you are standing in the need of Jesus' sacrifice, or are you, like the Pharisee, good enough on your own? And we wonder, does God grade on the curve? And as long as I'm somewhere in the middle there, I'm going to be all right? Well, confession allows us to leave behind our sin. Confession is a change in attitude. It recognizes that God is the source of our righteousness. It's not within us. God sees us as we truly are, and so do others. They see us as we truly are. And so we have a choice, either to blow smoke and point to others, or to use a mirror to look at ourselves. 
seeing our sin, but also seeing our need for forgiveness and that God is willing to give that to us. We recognize that Jesus' sacrifice is for us too. We are in need of righteousness, and so we all hope that what happens here is for us too. So tonight, let's allow God to wash us and to re recreate us in him, His image, the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Beverly and I came to the Hope Center in August of last year. I came here because I relocated here from the reservation. came here trying to um, have a better life <laughs> and a home for my daughter. The First United Methodist Church, with their work in the community and in downtown Rapid City, started um, kind of seeing an increased need. Um, with people who were living in poverty and people who did not have homes. They were able to hire an executive director and do a remodel to form a day center, which is now the Hope Center. You know, the Hope Center became a day center for people who are living without homes and people who are living in poverty. Um, there's various things that the Hope Center does and services that we provide. One of the main things that I um, utilize this place for is, you know, my mail. <laughs> got my got my daughter's report card. Yeah. She's making good grades, and you know, <laughs> center where we're a permanent address for people in the community who don't have a home or who don't have a permanent or stable home. Um, right now, we serve over 840 people in Rapid City with that service alone. So it's a it's a pretty huge need for people to have an address. Um, we also have um, phone service, so we allow people to use our phone number as their phone number, um, so people can call here and leave messages and that sort of thing for appointments or you know landlords or whatever it may be, um, and they can also use our phone for um, local and long distance calling. We have um, a morning devotional, and it we just want people to know that, that we are a faith-based institution and lots of people love to come and share their prayer requests, they like to share their thoughts, you know, and different things and it's really humbling when you hear someone who's sleeping under the bridge talk about their faith in God and how they know that God's going to see them through this and it truly is. We also do document storage, so we store birth certificates, social security cards, other important documentation, so they don't get lost or stolen. Um, 
We also do um, a lot of advocacy work, um, just getting to know our guests, getting to know their stories, where they're at, what their needs are, and then working with them to get up, get set up with different um, resources in the community that are fitting to them. We have one gentleman who was a chronic alcoholic and we used to see him in some pretty terrible situations. Well, he has now gotten sober and he's been sober a long time. And the other day when we asked him, you know, what, what made you get sober and quit? And he said, it was you ladies here. He said, I just really realized that this was a place where I had friends. I think more so than actual jobs or houses, relationships, I think are our successes. Probably the people. Always smiling, always willing to tell you something if you need to know something. Very helpful. Our gathered worship has ended for the evening, but our race goes on. The faith we celebrate here continues to be the faith we keep out there. So as you have poured yourself out in worship tonight, in song and in prayer, in fellowship and in unity, may we now go out to pour ourselves out in service to the world. God so loves the world, and so let us as the church be the witness that God is at work in the world. Go now with God and go in peace. Amen.